Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! I do apologise. Let's go back to the Bank of England and let's hope we've sorted the sound. Here's the Governor, Mark Carney. The new independent body of the bank, the FDC, a clear reason to achieve the inflation target over the medium term. Our inflation target is symmetric, meaning we care as much about inflation uh, above target as below target, and it applies at all time. <laughs> And subject to achieving the target, the NPC is also required to support the government's economic policy, which is currently to achieve strong, sustainable, and balanced growth. So in the, under this system, what Mervyn King termed constrained discretion, the bank takes its orders from the remit and is accountable to Parliament and the people for its performance. And the expectations of Parliament and people have certainly changed since the days that Montague Norman justified his decisions to a compliant predecessor of the Treasury Select Committee by appealing opaquely to his instincts. That's not a response I've dared to mention during my 30-odd parliamentary testimonies, and you'll know I'm in trouble when I, when I do. The need for the bank to be open and accountable is greater than ever not least because of a growing distrust of institutions and the experts who reside within them, but also because better public understanding makes our policies more effective. And that's why the Bank of England has dramatically increased the scale and I'd argue the quality of, of our outreach. We now publish all the relevant information for our decisions on the day that that decision is released. We disclose all the key judgments underlying our forecasts, and we account for differences with those forecasts uh, when they occur. We leverage our network of 12 regional agencies by meeting with thousands of businesses every year across the country, discussing with tens of thousands of people who attend our town halls and our public forums. And we engage with hundreds of thousands more over social media. Turning to the performance, the gains from independence have been enormous. In the two decades that followed, inflation averaged just below 2% compared with over 6% in the two decades preceding independence. Inflation has also been one-fifth as volatile. And crucially, independence and the credibility that came with it allowed monetary policy to respond boldly and effectively to the biggest financial crisis in a century. And it leaves the Bank of England well placed to address a range of developments, possible developments around Brexit. Now, in the past 20 years, we've also learned a few lessons. I'm going to highlight three before closing. The first is that the financial crisis exposed how a healthy focus on price stability could become a dangerous distraction. Central banks won the war against inflation during the Great Moderation only to lose the peace as vulnerabilities built inexorably. Now, monetary policy is not best placed to address the risk to financial stability. But the challenge is that the necessary financial policy decisions are also subject to time inconsistency. Financial lobbies are strong, and the temptations of a dash for growth powerful. Conversely, there are no obvious or immediate rewards to taking tough decisions that are necessary to avoid a future crisis. In the world of financial stability, success is an orphan. And that's why when the Bank of England was fundamentally reformed after the crisis, the procedures and structures of the MPC were largely replicated in the bank's two new committees, the FPC and the PRC. Crucially, all of the bank committees have access to all of the bank's information and analysis. They're all well informed about each other's reaction functions, and they can all coordinate their policies if it's appropriate. The Bank of England's committees are independent, but they're not isolated. The second lesson of the past two decades has been the importance of flexibility in flexible inflation targeting. So while the inflation target applies at all times, 
our remit has always acknowledged that inflation may deviate temporarily from target on account of shocks. And since 2013, the remit has explicitly recognized that in exceptional circumstances, bringing inflation back to target too rapidly could cause undesirable volatility in output and employment. In exceptional circumstances such as today, when the economy is facing profound structural change, the MPC can extend the horizon over which it returns inflation to target from above in order to balance the effect on jobs and activity. After all, even though monetary policy can, cannot prevent the weaker real income growth that's likely to accompany the transition to new trading arrangements with the EU, it can influence how this hit to incomes is distributed between job losses and price rises. And this brings me to my final point. Well, carefully circumscribed independence is highly effective in delivering both price and financial stability, it can't deliver lasting prosperity, and it cannot solve broader societal challenges. This bears emphasizing because in recent years a host of issues have been laid at the door of the Bank of England from housing affordability to poor productivity. Calls for the bank to solve these challenges ignore our carefully defined objectives, and they confuse independence with omnipotence. Monetary and financial stability are foundational. They're necessary for prosperity, but they aren't sufficient to deliver it. The biggest determinants of the UK's medium-term prosperity will be the country's new relationship with the EU and the series of reforms that that relationship catalyzes. Most of the necessary adjustments are real in nature and therefore not in the gift of monetary policy makers. But the bank will do everything it can to support the adjustment consistent with its statutory obligations. We'll continue to assess and express our independent assessment of the risks associated with Brexit. We'll use all our powers, consistent with our remits, to mitigate those risks and to smooth the adjustment to new opportunities. Monetary policy will continue to be set to achieve the inflation target in a way that helps smooth real adjustment and supports jobs in the wake of very large external forces. We'll make sure that banks are capitalized so they can withstand any severe shock, however unlikely, uh, any severe shock that could be associated with Brexit and still be able to meet the demands of households and businesses for credit. The financial system as a whole will have the capacity to finance the transition and to seize the opportunities uh, that come beyond. And these are the best contributions that the Bank of England can make to the good of the people of the United Kingdom. So ultimately, the prosperity of the UK will reflect not just the final Brexit arrangements but also the government's broader fiscal and structural policies. And the first speaker at this conference is best placed uh, to address these topics. Now, it could have been very different. As some of you know, the Prime Minister began her career as a new graduate at the Bank of England before leaving after six years to pursue other interests, ultimately politics. Whilst at the Bank, the Prime Minister worked in our Economic Intelligence Department the cutting edge then of our activities. And during her time, she accomplished uh, many great things and was destined for much more. Just imagine, Prime Minister, what could have become of your career if you'd stayed. <laughs> you, could have, you could have been here in Fishmonger's Hall introducing yourself. Um, uh, but instead, you've, you've come here uh, by a road less traveled. Theresa May was elected MP for Maidenhead in 1997, just as the bank was getting to grips with its newfound independence. She held a number of positions in the shadow cabinets of a string of opposition leaders and served as chair of the Conservative Party. After the formation of the coalition government in 2010, she would become the longest serving Home Secretary in over 60 years, during a period where she confronted many of society's biggest challenges, for example, introducing legislation to tackle domestic violence, to eradicate modern slavery, and to counter terrorism. Never afraid of a challenge, she stepped into the breach to become Prime Minister following the referendum. The Prime Minister and her government are committed to making the most of the opportunities that Brexit brings and more fundamentally to working 
to build a stronger, fairer, and more prosperous country for all. So please join me in welcoming the Prime Minister, Theresa May. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for that introduction. And as one who you just heard began her professional life at the Bank of England some 40 years ago, it's a great pleasure to address this conference today. Uh, your reference to uh, where I worked in the bank reminded me that when I applied to the Bank of England as a geography graduate, when the application form asked which part of the bank I'd like to work in, I put the international department. So I thought geography graduate, that would fit. So the Bank of England chose to put me into economic intelligence. When I first started working for the bank back in 1977, it was a very different institution from the one we see today. Central banking then was a profession shrouded in secrecy. I think the spirit of that time is captured in a story which the former governor, Mervyn King, tells. When Lord King first joined the Bank of England, he asked Paul, Paul Volcker, the eminent chairman of the Federal Reserve under Presidents Carter and Reagan, what quality a central banker should seek to embody. Mystique, was his reply. Much has changed in the years since, and for the better. You, Governor, have contributed to that improvement through the reforms you have led at the Bank of England. Today, openness and transparency are defining characteristics of a modern central bank. And this conference celebrates an important milestone in the evolution of this institution, the granting of operational independence. The newly elected Labour government decided shortly after the 1997 general election that they would do what successive governors and indeed some Conservative chancellors had long talked about, give the bank responsibility for setting the official short-term interest rate. As a newly elected MP at that time, I remember those debates well and looking back on them now after 20 years in which independent monetary policy making has become the norm around the world, the disagreements which then divided the House of Commons on the issue seem rather academic. The successful adoption of inflation targeting in 1992 had already taken much of the political heat out of rate setting. And fears that the absence of a formal dual mandate to protect employment as well as target inflation might put jobs at risk have proved unfounded. And I would like to pay tribute to you, Governor, to your predecessors, Lord King of Lothbury and the late Lord George, and to all the members who have served on the Monetary Policy Committee over the last two decades. You have been a dedicated group of public servants, motivated to serve the public interest and to discharge the responsibility which Parliament has given you to the best of your ability. And there is much to be proud of over the last 20 years. Whatever the debates at the time, there was never any real disagreement about what the central aim of monetary policy should be to eliminate the high inflation which had bedeviled the British economy from decades. From the start of inflation targeting in 1992 and operational independence in 1997, that is what the bank has helped to achieve. As it has in other countries, central bank independence has helped improve credibility and accountability, has successfully anchored inflation expectations and has contributed to low and stable inflation. The results have been impressive. Since independence, UK inflation has been much more stable than it was in the previous 20 years, when it fluctuated from 1% to 22%. We know that high inflation hurts ordinary people, and that low and stable inflation benefits households and businesses. The fact that inflation of 22% sounds outlandish to us today is a tribute to your success. But as we reflect on the undoubted successes of the last 20 years, we cannot do so with any complacency. Yes, inflation targeting and operational independence contributed to a period of steady growth, low and stable inflation, and general expansion in the year, 10 years after 1997. But problems were developing, which would later become apparent during the financial crisis of 2007-2008. The Great Recession which followed that crisis brought some of the most challenging economic times our country has known. The bank was inevitably caught up in the dramatic events of 2007 and 2008. The tripartite regulatory system of which the bank was a part did not prove to be a success. It failed the country during the financial crisis and we've had to live with the consequences of that failure ever since. 
Our GDP fell by more than 6% as the UK endured our deepest recession since the Second World War. Successive governments have been forced to take difficult decisions to restore the public finances to order. And these have been decisions which no government would ever want to take. The British people, who played no part in causing the financial crisis, have had to make sacrifices in order to return the economy to health and ease the burden of debt on future generations. Real progress has been made over the last seven years. The bank has played its part, using its independent monetary policy tools of interest rates and quantitative easing to support our economy through the crisis and into the recovery. The government has worked to repair our country's finances, and the latest public sector borrowing figures show that the deficit has been reduced by more than two-thirds, from a post-war high of 10% of GDP in 2009-10 to 2.3% of GDP in 2016-17. But in truth, much work remains ahead of us, and for all our progress, we should neither forget nor underestimate the scale of the sacrifices which have been necessary to get us this far. The impact those sacrifices have had on ordinary working people have led some to lose faith in free market capitalism. And globalization, which has brought us a great many benefits, has also brought changes which have contributed to a wider sense that our economy is not working as it should for everyone in our society. These are understandable responses. There are genuine problems with our economy which need to be addressed. But as we do so, we should never forget the immense value and potential of an open, innovative, free market economy which operates with the right rules and regulations. When countries make the transition from closed, restricted, centrally planned economies to open free market policies, the same things happen. Life expectancy increases and infant mortality fails, falls. Absolute poverty shrinks and disposable income grows. Access to education is widened and rates of illiteracy plummet. Participation in cultural life is extended and more people have the chance to contribute. It is in open free market economies that technological breakthroughs are made which transform, improve and save lives. It is in open free market economies that personal freedoms and liberties find their surest protection. A free market economy operating under the right rules and regulations is the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. It was the new combination which led societies out of darkness and stagnation and into the light of the modern age. And in essence, it is very simple. It consists of an open marketplace in which everyone is free to participate, regulated under the rule of law, with personal freedoms, equality and human rights democratically guaranteed, and an accountable government progressively taking the economic activity taxing the economic activity which the market generates, to fund high quality public services which are freely available to all citizens according to need. That is unquestionably the best and indeed the only sustainable means of increasing the living standards of everyone in a country. And we should never forget that raising the living standards and protecting the jobs of ordinary working people is the central aim of all economic policy. Helping each generation to live longer, fuller, more secure lives than the one which went before them. Not serving an abstract doctrine or an ideological concept, but serving the real interests of the British people. And those of us who believe that the interests of the British people are best served through a successful, open, free market economy need to be honest about where it is not currently working or delivering for ordinary working people today. That is why the government is leading a determined programme of wide-reaching economic reform. We've already overhauled our system of banking regulation to put the Bank of England at the centre of the new framework. The Financial Policy Committee protects financial stability through macro-prudential regulation. The Prudential Regulation Authority serves as a micro-prudential re regulator. And the Financial Conduct Authority regulates the conduct of businesses in our vibrant financial sector. We implemented the recommendations of the Independent Commission on Banking and the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, putting in place strict new rules on bank ring fencing and enhancing individual accountability to raise standards. Our economy has made great strides in the last few years, but we know that for too long, too many communities across the United Kingdom have not seen the benefits of economic growth and prosperity. 
That waste of potential is bad for the areas concerned and bad for our country's wider productivity. The bank has always taken the economic health of our whole UK seriously, as your formidable network of local agents based out in the nations and regions of the UK testifies. And through our industrial strategy, the government is playing its part in promoting growth across the whole country. That strategy will help business invest in the latest technologies, earn local areas of excellent international export champions, and support the skills and innovation we need to succeed in the industries of the future. A thriving financial services sector, providing high quality jobs right across the United Kingdom, vital to our future prosperity. That sector benefits from a strong and respected framework of regulation, which incentivizes innovation. And we will work with the sector to ensure the UK remains the world's financial center and the global hub of fintech. Britain now has a record number of people in work and our flexible labor market has contributed to that success. Many people value the flexibility of our system, but that flexibility cannot be one-sided. That's why I commissioned Matthew Taylor to conduct a thorough review into modern employment practices in our economy. His report recommended that all work should be fair and decent with scope for development and fulfillment, and that is an ambition we fully share. Britain has some of the world's very best higher education institutions, researchers and engineers, but we know that our system of technical education leaves too many of our young people without the skills they need to get a job. That holds them back and hurts our economy. So our new T-level qualifications will reverse decades of drift and create a new high-quality vocational equivalent to A-levels. Britain sets the global standard for high-quality corporate governance. International firms are attracted to the UK, in part because of the strengths of our regulatory system. But we know that to stay competitive, we must keep our standards high and ensure that bad examples of corporate governance do not undermine the public's faith in our market economy. So our reforms to corporate governance will give workers and shareholders a stronger voice in the boardroom and ensure that our biggest firms are incentivized to take decisions which are in the right long-term interests of their businesses. These reforms will bring greater transparency, openness and accountability to markets and to the corporate sector. The very same principles that the bank has lived up to in its work through the Monetary Policy Committee. Now some argue that a free market economy is an end in itself and that drawing attention to the downsides is somehow anti-business. Others would use the imbalances which are now apparent as a justification for the total rejection of the free market economy which has done so much to improve our lives. Instead, they advocate ideologically extreme policies, which have long ago been shown to fail, and which are failing people today in places like Venezuela. My argument has always been that if you want to preserve and improve a system which has delivered unparalleled benefits, you have to take seriously its faults and do all you can to address them. Not to do so would put everything we have achieved together as a country at risk. It would lead to a wider loss of faith in free markets and risk a return to the failed ideologies of the past. A return to protectionism in international trade and to inflationary policies at home. Far from somehow protecting the poorest and most vulnerable in our society, that outcome would surely hurt them the most. This is a crucial time to address these fundamental economic questions. Last week in Florence, I set out my vision for the new economic partnership I want our country to build with the European Union in the years ahead. That vision is rooted in a belief in a well-regulated, open, free market economy with sound money and stable prices. As I set out, in leaving the EU, the UK will no longer be members of the single market or customs union. That, of course, will mean changes. You cannot have all the benefits of membership of the single market without its obligations. So our task is to find a new framework that allows for a close economic partnership, but which holds those rights and obligations into new and different balance. In forging that partnership, that new partnership, we start from an unprecedented position. At the point of our exit, we will have exactly the same rules and regulations as the EU, as our EU withdrawal bill will ensure they are carried over into our domestic law. The challenge then is not how to bring our rules and regulations closer together, but what to do when one of us wants to make changes. That fact should give us confidence, 
and I believe there are further good reasons to be ambitious and optimistic about what lies ahead. The UK is one of the largest economies in the world and EU's biggest export market. Businesses and jobs across the con continent rely on our shared trade. And more fundamentally, we share a common commitment to the principles of an open free market economy, which I referred to earlier. We believe in free trade, in rigorous and fair competition, in strong consumer rights and in a rejection of protectionism. And whether it's on goods or on services, including the excellent financial services for which the UK has a global reputation, creating needless new barriers to trade between the EU and its biggest market would benefit no one. The UK's financial markets provide support for businesses and consumers right across the EU, reducing the cost of capital and supporting choice and innovation for consumers. It is in neither the EU's nor the UK's interest to see these financial service markets fragment. And that is another reason I am confident we can agree a new partnership that enables us to continue to work together to bring prosperity to all our peoples. And that is a responsibility which democratically elected governments and institutions dedicated to the public good, like the Bank of England, both share, to promote the prosperity of the people we serve. For the Bank of England, strengthened and improved since the financial crisis, that means discharging its responsibilities to keep inflation on target and maintain the wider health and sustainability of the financial sector. For the government, that means stepping up to its role, ensuring that the rules and regulations which define the free market are designed to make it serve the interests of ordinary working people. Success in this mission must be underpinned by a balanced approach to public spending. That means continuing to deal with our debts so that our economy can remain strong and we can protect people's jobs. At the same time, it means investing in our vital public services like schools and hospitals, which our successful management of the economy has made possible. To abandon that balanced approach with unfunded borrowing and significantly higher levels of taxation which da would damage our economy, threaten jobs and hurt working people. It would mean paying even more in debt interest, which already costs us more each year than we spend on schools. Ultimately, it would mean less money for the public services we all rely on. So we can already see in outline the challenges and opportunities which will define the bank's third decade of independence. Building a new economic partnership with the European Union, which will deliver prosperity for all our people and making the most of the opportunities which Brexit presents. Reforming our economy so that the benefits of a well-regulated free market are felt in all parts of our country and by everyone in our society. And taking a balanced approach to public spending so debt falls as our economy grows and we can invest in the public services on which we all depend. I have no doubt that the bank will continue its work to deliver the monetary and financial stability that is essential for a successful economy as we make the most of the opportunities ahead. Governor, I wish you and your distinguished guests well over the next two days as you explore what the future may hold. Thank you. So we're going to wait. Uh, we think various journalists are going to be allowed to ask questions, so we'll wait for those questions. But the top line from Mrs May's speech, the free market economy improves people's lives. Let's have a listen to some questions right now. One of the faults you yourself identified was that the bank's programme of ultra-low interest rates and QE have had bad side effects, particularly on poor people. What should be done about that? Well, first of all, Barry, I didn't identify that as a fault. What I, the point that I was making was that action that is taken to deal with one uh, issue and was necessary action and yep. rightly taken by an independent bank. Um, does have implications for others. Uh, and I was pointing out some of those implications. And of course, what then happens, as we have done, is that it is up to government 
to look to see what it uh, considers necessary and can do to mitigate any implications which it feels do need to be addressed, such as, for example, the steps we've taken to encourage saving, because, of course, as we know, low interest rates uh, are good news for borrowers, but not good news for savers. So I think what happens is then for government to look to see whether it should mitigate any of those uh, side effects, any of those implications of the action taken. Excellent. Um, uh, Andy, uh, Verity. Prime Minister, you said you reject protectionism, and you've also made it very clear how unhappy you are with the decision of the Trump administration to impose punitive tariffs on Bombardier. Can you reassure the country's exporters that we're not about to enter a tit-for-tat trade war with their number two export market, the United States? Well, first of all, if I could just comment on the Bombardier issue. Um, this is very important for us in the United Kingdom because of the impact uh, any change would have uh, in relation to jobs in Northern Ireland. Obviously, over 4,000 people employed by Bombardier in Northern Ireland. The judgment that came out of the US Department of Commerce, of course, is a preliminary uh, judgment, a preliminary finding. And I will continue to work uh, uh, with the Canadian Prime Minister, with the Canadian government. And indeed, I spoke to both Arlene Foster and Michelle O'Neill from the DUP and Sinn Féin yesterday about how we can work together to impress on the American government the importance of Bombardier to Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, obviously, what I would say in relation to Boeing is that, of course, we have a long-term partnership with Boeing and various aspects of government, and this is not the sort of behaviour you expect from a long-term partner, and it undermines that partnership. Uh, but on the, um, on the wider issue, I think there is a real challenge for us globally today, because I think that there are aspects of protectionism creeping in around the world. I think I have said before I want the UK to be a global champion of free trade. Because I think we need to, those of us who believe in free trade need to stand up and not just e explain its wider benefits, but help to explain its benefits to individuals. There are people who feel that globalization has left them behind. We need to ensure our country, our economy is working for everyone, but we also need to show why free trade is so important in raising living standards, in developing grow, uh, the growth of economies, in bringing prosperity into our countries. And I think that is uh, a discussion we now need to have because we do see elements of protectionism creeping in around the world. Um, Philip uh, Hildebrand, please. Prime Minister, we're, and many other financial firms, are intensely focused on contributing to responsible finance. One of the ways, one of the many ways we do this is by focusing on hiring from disadvantaged sections of society, hiring from state schools, a deliberate program to push in this direction, which addresses many of the issues you've talked about. But we also need responsible politics. And I guess one of the questions is, you know, to do that, we need to be able to stay here in this great city and in this great country. And so my question would be, how can you help us get some certainty that the transition period, which you've outlined, which we all welcome, uh, as a likely outcome, that this doesn't lead to simply a longer period of uncertainty of where we end up at the end of the transition period, whether it's two or three or four years. I've noticed you've left some an open window how long that period could be in your speech in Florence. It will be very important that the transition story doesn't simply become an excuse for not knowing what comes at the end of the road. Can you give us any indication of how we can stay in this great city, in this great financial center, and in this great country? Well, we, of course, want to do everything we can to ensure that we continue to see the city of London um, continuing to play its role as a global financial center. And we want firms to be able to stay here and continue um, as they have done and, and uh, the contribution that they've made. On the question of the implementation period, and I use the phrase implementation very specifically, because this is a period of time which will be necessary to implement any practical changes that are needed as a result of our exiting the EU and the new partnership that we will have built. And by definition, you could only have that if you know what that end state, what the uh, final partnership is that you're working towards. So the timeline that I see is that we agree what that uh, new deep and special partnership is, we agree what that economic partnership is, obviously there are other issues like security we have to agree as well. Uh, and then that implementation period is there in order to just put those practical changes in place. And some of those will be for government. IT systems may need to change in certain areas, for example. But 
as I said in my speech in Florence, what's important, I think, is the double lock. And the double lock is, first of all, that you know that that implementation will, period will be there, so there is a period of time to adjust, there's no cliff edge, but secondly, that it will be time limited. We said around two years, it could be that some aspects of the implementation can be brought forward if there's agreement that that makes sense and it can be done without um, uh, disrupting uh, the process. The idea is to have order and uh, smooth withdrawal, and that's why that implementation period is there, but it will definitely be time limited because we're leaving the EU in March 2019. Okay. Theresa May, the Prime Minister, uh, speaking at the so Bank of England. Final question about... Um, Brexit and, and how long the transition period will go on for and whether that would lead to more uncertainty. But the top line from her speech, it, she was saying today that the free market economy improves your life effectively. Uh, she said, quote, it's unquestionably the best and indeed the only sustainable means of increasing the living standards of everyone in this country, in a country, actually, she said, and we should never forget that raising the living standards and protecting the jobs of ordinary working people is the central aim of all economic policy. She said um, her government will continue with its balanced approach and that means, she said, continuing to deal with our debts as well as continuing to invest in our public services. She, she pointed out that our country's debt interest per year costs us more than we spend on schools. Um, she said the free market economy, in her opinion, means poverty falls, access to education widens and we live longer. Now, the Prime Minister returned this morning to the place where her career began 40 years ago at the Bank of England. And it's also 20 years ago since the Bank of England was granted independence. Labour's decision just four days after its landslide election victory in 1997 was seen by some as the most radical shape-up of the bank's 300-year history. I will not shrink from the tough decisions needed to deliver stability for long-term growth. I therefore decided to give the Bank of England operational responsibility for setting interest rates with immediate effect. The government will continue to set the inflation target and the bank will have responsibility for setting interest rates to meet the target. The government's policy is set out in a letter I sent to the governor of the Bank of England yesterday, the text of which I am releasing now. It is the government's intention to legislate for these proposals as soon as possible. A young-looking Gordon Brown, two decades on, at a conference marking the anniversary of the Bank of England being granted independence, Theresa May set out an argument we can expect Conservatives to discuss at their own conference in Manchester next week. The contrast she seeks to emphasise with Jeremy Corbyn is obvious. A day after his proudly socialist pitch to Labour's conference, she mounted a strong defence of the free market economy. The Prime Minister defended the free market economy in her speech, calling it the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. But Jeremy Corbyn says capitalism is facing a crisis of legitimacy. He has called for more state control, including the nationalisation of water, railways, Royal Mail and energy firms. Theresa May restated her determination to be tough on public spending and continue a policy of deficit reduction. While Jeremy Corbyn wants to end austerity and spend more on public services. He wants to fund this by introducing higher levels of taxation for the top 5% of earners and for businesses. But Theresa May says significantly higher levels of taxation would damage the UK's economy and threaten jobs. But whose vision will strike the killer punch? Let's take a look at the Prime Minister speaking at the Bank of England earlier. A free market economy operating under the right rules and regulations is the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. It was the new combination which led societies out of darkness and stagnation and into the light of the modern age. And in essence, it is very simple. It consists of an open marketplace in which everyone is free to participate, regulated under the rule of law, with personal freedoms, equality and human rights democratically guaranteed, and an accountable government progressively taking the economic taxing the economic activity which the market generates to fund high-quality public services which are freely available to all citizens according to need. That is unquestionably the best and indeed the only sustainable means of increasing the living standards of everyone in a country. 
Theresa May. Well, joining me here in the studio are the Conservative MP, Chris Philp, and Faisal Shaheen, the Director of the Centre for Labour and Social Studies. Um, first of all, Faisal, why do you think there is a crisis of legitimacy in capitalism? Well, I think what happens often is this sort of black and white conversation about capitalism and free markets. Actually, what we have often is a hybrid model, and both actually Jeremy Corbyn and Theresa May talk about a hybrid model. That's what we have right now. We don't have a free market system. But the problem that there's a crisis is that we're applying those principles in places where the profit motive doesn't work. So, for instance, we've got private ownership of trains, of utilities, where there's no competition. And at the same time, we're seeing also that we are constantly using public money to give to private companies, which is turning into profit. And really what's happening is that we are seeing huge changes in the levels of inequality in this country since we've applied those principles in the wrong places. So this isn't to say that we should have all the public ownership. This is to say that right now we're using free market principles in the wrong places and that's creating profits for a certain group of people and resulting in very poor outcomes for others in society. What do you say in response to that, that actually it is time for more state intervention, that nationalisation of some of those key industries would produce better results and better service for consumers um, than has been in the private sector? Well, of course, no one is, no one is arguing for uh, zero regulation. No one is arguing for totally untrammeled free markets. What the Prime Minister said was that free markets create jobs, they create wealth, they generate all of the tax revenue, which pays for doctors, teachers and, teachers and nurses. And we need to get the balance right. So where the market does fail, um, we should intervene. So, for example, the minimum wage is a good example. Um, the Labour government introduced it. The mm. Conservative government massively increased the minimum wage. Although they weren't few... in favour of it when Labour brought it At in. At the beginning, 15 years ago, but mm. it was a Conservative government that put through the big biggest ever increase a year or two ago, which is a good thing. And that actually is why inequality, income inequality in this country has actually gone down in the last seven years. Right, but has austerity damaged the economy? Well, I think people, austerity wasn't a choice. Austerity was a necessity. In 2010, we had a deficit of 150 billion pounds a year, 10% of our national economy. And you quite simply can't go on spending more than you raise in tax each year. So getting that deficit down from 10% of GDP where it was to 2% today was a necessity. Just, but we've done that while managing... Great, I do, I do. One of the things I really struggle with politicians is horrible phrases like austerity wasn't a choice, it was a necessity. <coughs> it, it was a choice. It might not have been the wrong choice, but it certainly was a choice. Under your economic belief, it may not have been a choice. But, you know, you put two economists in a room and you get three different opinions. So it was a choice. And you, you shouldn't try and spin people on that. Well, let's, let's, let's consider the alternative, which is that we didn't take action. You know, we'd now be paying 4 or 5% on our national debt. So instead of paying £46 billion pounds a year in, in interest, which is a lot, we'd be paying 150 or and 250 billion And what's the level of debt at the moment and the level of the deficit that you said you would have got rid of by now? Well, the deficit, by is, is, we've got it down from 10% to 2%, so there is still a little bit more work to do. Right. I mean, let, let's look at that issue of austerity wasn't a choice. Mm -hmm. The flip side was what was being proposed by Labour at the time, which was to some extent boosting the economy, mm -hmm. um, trying to improve um, and incentivise uh, consumer demand, although Labour did at the time want to cut capital expenditure. Do you think that would have worked better? adding to borrowing and adding then to the overall debt. Yeah, so the point is about why we had that debt is because we bailed out the banks, right? Because free nonsense. markets didn't, well, let's let's it, let free markets it. didn't <laughs> work because we bailed out the banks. We had a recession caused by not enough regulation on capitalism and then we had to pay more in benefits, etc. Right. because more people were out of work. Okay. Of course, just, right? It wasn't this. Labour that wasn't caused that mess. Um, so, so you would have seen the banks fail. So what would have happened, right? So okay, fine. We took that decision. We took that decision. That Labour, was a took that decision. Labour took that to, decision. Labour took that decision, by the way. To bail out banks, we shouldn't act as if that wasn't something where capitalism okay. failed. And also, look, with austerity, the reason why we need more public investment, at that time, private investors had stopped investing. So that slows down the economy. So the public sector has to make up for that slowdown at those times. And actually, that's why austerity has failed in its own terms. Why is it that Osborne missed every single target? Because he recognised that when he started taking that money out, yeah. the economy slowed down and he had well, to stop doing lot, that. There's a lot to answer there. Let me start with the banks. So oh. the idea that the debt is caused by the banks. So the banks were bailed out by the Labour government because they hadn't regulated the banks properly in the run-up to the crunch. You and were you calling, calling, for, hang on, hang on. calling for the hang, regulation hang of those banks? Well, well actually, and actually we've mm. now put in place suffer regulation. Mm. The, the banks got bailed out net of receipts to the tune of about £50 billion. Pounds, okay? Our national debt is getting on for £2 trillion. So our national debt is around about 2.5% attributable to the bank debt bailout. So you're 2.5% correct. 
and 97.5% uh, wow. not correct. <laughs> now, really on, the, on the point, well, let's be fair, let's be fair. So on the point of, yeah, would, on, the, on, the, on the point of, um, you know, what would have happened um, had we done um, what Pfizer mm. was suggesting? Look, I mean, I think the policies George Osborne pursued were quite successful in the sense that we have record numbers this of jobs in this country. This now, hang on, hang on, hang on. No, if you compare, let me finish. I didn't, I didn't interrupt Hang on, Pfizer, I'll come back to you. If we just compare what we've done to, say, France, in this country, unemployment is down to 4.5%. In France, where Francois Hollande pursued a programme a little bit more similar to what you're proposing, unemployment is up at 12%. So we've got the case studies, France and the UK, All right, well and let, clearly we're in a better position. Let's take the issue of unemployment, because yes, the government likes to talk about and boast to some extent, uh, rightly or wrongly, that unemployment is at record low levels. Mm. Um, isn't that something to champion? Mm. So employment at record levels, of course, when you just take that one number, but when you scratch beneath the surface, you start to see very quickly whether it's precarious employment, whether it's actually wages below inflation. Like I find it hilarious to talk about the last 10 years as some kind of success when this 10 years of wage growth has been as poor for 200, we haven't seen something like this for 200 years. Capitalism and the type of model that we have of capitalism right now has played out and what we've seen is you know we would have thought more competition we've actually seen more concentration if you take a model like the US where we'd say that's oh great free markets we've seen more concentration of industry less people owning those means of production and actually all that's happening now is that the left is saying we need to spread this wealth out a bit this isn't working for the majority mm. right let's be, now let me just bring in Martin listening to the two of them um, and you picked up on the issue of saying that austerity wasn't a choice there were also phrases like the Labour government had maxed out on its credit card and actually the population at the time did seem in large numbers to buy into that feeling that we needed to tighten belts um, that we did need to cut costs and we did need to become leaner and unemployment has remained low what is your view? Do you agree with Pfizer that actually, if you scratch beneath the surface of those headlines, it is not a pretty picture? Well, I'd probably plunk my chair in the middle of the <laughs> two of them, if I'm really honest. I mean, I, I, uh, no, I, I'm <laughs> not a member of any party. But, the, you know, it's interesting. My slight disagreement with what you said earlier, you talked about these companies making big profits and bad outcomes. Well, I believe in the free market to an extent, not an unfettered free market. I have no problem with companies making big profits. I have a big problem with bad outcomes. Mm -hmm. So I would have got rid of the first bit of, of, of your explanation and focused on the bad outcomes. But some of those things are coming together, right? But if we focus on, are the outcomes good, don't care about the profits. That's for me the point. It doesn't matter. I'd, if two companies, one's in public ownership and it works it less efficiently than a company that's in private ownership makes some makes some profit but has better outcomes for the nation, but that's the point. I don't We've mind. We've seen that play out, right? We've seen but, this but, case studies, but, let me, but, rail. but where I th what I think has happened is in those public goods, those state-owned public goods that we have privatised, we haven't got regulation right. Politicians have, in the energy market fundamentally messed up because what they do is they say we want more people to switch, but then effectively all those policies say switching is, of course, if you want people to switch, you have to have big differentials. Some people have to pay more than others, and then they don't like it that some people have to pay more because they tend to be the most vulnerable, so they try and skew the markets, drop the differentiation, and wonder why people don't switch as much. So that doesn't work. i just give you some stats. This is very shocking for you. Doing a poll on my website, we're not a political website, I've had about 12,000 people who voted in this so far, it's not statistically representative. Here's the views on whether we should renationalise that we asked at the moment. These are the over 70% areas. Over 70% say renationalise water, of course no competition but privatisation there. Rail services, postal services, gas and electricity. Over 50% say bus services and director inquiries. The only ones less than 50% oil, phone and internet and aviation. <laughs> there is a real mass movement out there, popularity of renationalising because people don't believe the regulation mm. of the free market has worked. Right. So and you, I, could you fix you that? You have not mm. persuaded the public on this, have you? Well, I think I would accept your point that regulation in all areas is not perfect and it requires improvement. I mean, you, you mentioned trains. I mean, I represent a constituency on Southern Rail's network, so mm. I've experienced that um, firsthand. And of course, with energy prices, um, for the third of people, about 7 million households who do switch, they get fantastic deals. The two thirds of people who sort of don't bother shopping around don't get a good deal. So a 90 year old right. struggling grandmother pays more to boil a kettle than I do, a rich, savvy, internet accessed man. Well, that, and that's why we were talking not during. Good. Well, you're right, it's not. It's that's a public why, good. But, but hang on, let me, let me answer the question. Don't talk that, over that's, each why, other. that's why we were talking during the election about getting uh, further regulation to control those prices right. where they are excessive. And that is, that is reasonable. I okay, that. we're going to have to end the argument, but I'm sure we will have it again and again. Thank you both for coming in.
Now, just a day after the Labour leader Jeremy Corbyn delivered a speech saying capitalism is in crisis, the Prime Minister has been defending the free market. She said free market economics was the only sustainable means of raising the living standards of everyone in the country. Well, let's uh, talk to our political correspondent, Leila Nathu. Leila, some people are going to say that the very fact that Theresa May is defending the free market suggests that Mr Corbyn has, has hit the spot. Well, George, this was a speech at a conference uh, designed to mark 20 years since the independence of the Bank of England. So it has been in the diary. And it is worth notice, noting that the Conservative election manifesto did make that argument for capitalism, free markets being the best way to achieve prosperity for all. But I think it is telling that the Prime Minister has restated that case less than 24 hours after Jeremy Corbyn pledged to transform the economy, take on what he called the broken model of neoliberalism. And I think it certainly shows that the argument, the debate over the best way of managing the economy is a live one. So we had Theresa May arguing forcefully for a free market economy, arguing the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created was capitalism. She was talking about a balanced approach to public finances. And I think although the, the mention of Labour was not explicit, she has certainly decided that far from dismissing or ignoring Jeremy Corbyn's uh, economic approach, it's certainly worth directly taking on. Leila, thank you. A Conservative Prime Minister running to the defence of capitalism would have seemed in another age like a fish talking at the benefit of water. Today, Theresa May felt the need to tell an audience at the Bank of England that a free, well-regulated market economy is the greatest agent of collective human progress ever created. Why? Does she see Jeremy Corbyn's brand of new economics as a big enough threat to address? Or does she suspect the country itself is moving away from the things the beliefs her party has long taken for granted. They're not unrelated, of course, so perhaps the bigger question is, is she right to worry? Is capitalism having a quiet crisis of confidence? Here's Chris Cook. The mood on our economic system appears to be shifting. Today, the Prime Minister felt obliged to defend free markets from assault. A tide of scepticism about capitalism has been coming in since the financial crisis. But these days, its clearest manifestation is the peaceful movement being led by Jeremy Corbyn. The capitalist system still faces a crisis of legitimacy stemming from the crash. Now is the time that government took a more active role in restructuring our economy. You might be blasé about all of this. After all, it's hardly a new complaint from the left that capitalism is in crisis. But the thing is, capitalism in Britain is in a crisis. You see, over the past few centuries, capitalism's genius in Britain has been delivering higher and higher productivity. That is to say, technological innovations have been incorporated that let the average worker produce more in a given hour. And that's made us all richer. It's fed into higher living standards. The problem is, that process has recently started to break down. This is a graph showing how much hourly productivity has grown over 10 years going back to the late 18th century. You can see it goes in fits and starts with bad times and good times. But on average, the amount that we produce for an hour of labour grows by about 15% over a decade. Productivity growth, though, is now at a 200-year low. For all the innovation around us, the amount of stuff a British worker can actually make in an hour has basically not increased for a decade. Most people don't talk about productivity in their day-to-day -day lives, but they do talk about their wage packets, because that's what matters for their living standards. And if we talk about the problem with wages over the last few years, one of the reasons their growth has been so low is because productivity hasn't been growing. It's no coincidence that the worst decade since Napoleon was around for wages has also been a catastrophic decade for productivity in Britain. Fresh research out tomorrow suggests this may have eroded support for liberal economics. This report co-authored by Matthew Elliott of the Legatum Institute, surveyed people on whether they agreed more with the proposition the pay of senior execs should be capped or businesses should pay their senior execs what they see fit. The research found a big majority of Labour voters went for capping, but 
So did Tory voters. What about government needs to do more to regulate how businesses behave versus government regulates too much? Most Labour voters want more state, but so do most Tories. Don't assume the scepticism, though, is driven just by young people, as the report's other co-author explains. Clearly, young, old, young voters and old voters are very different, and, and that's cl most clearly seen on social issues, where young voters are much more liberal and older voters are much more conservative. But actually, when it comes to economic issues, they're all broadly quite far to the left on a lot of economic issues. So what is to be done? The current debate, unfortunately, in this country has gone back to public, private, who owns what. What I think we actually should be having is a discussion about the shared responsibilities, but literally the shared risk-taking, the co-investment in new areas, which eventually will lead to profits, but in the meantime can also help solve massive societal problems, whether it's around climate change or the 21st century care system that we need for our aging population. Britain's economic malaise is that it's a country whose recent growth has come from working more, not working better. Chris Cook there. Well, we're joined now by the editor of The Spectator, Fraser Nelson, and here to offer a different social democrat perspective is Professor Anastasia Nisvetailova. She's the director of the City Political Economy Research Centre and was a member of John McDonnell's Economic Advisory Board until it disbanded last year. Down the line from New York, Professor Richard Wolff, an American Marxist economist who's written books including Capitalism Hits the Fan. Very nice to have all of you here, quite a range. Anastasia, I'm going to start with you. Uh, we're feeling the pulse here, and you saw in Chris's report the kind of questions that were being asked and the responses. Do you think something is really shifting now in how this country views capitalism and its benefits? Uh, I would say so. Um, I would say it's not only in this country. I would say um, capitalism is... Usually they say there are crises in capitalism, but they come and go. Um, there are structural conditions that have not been really resolved since 2007. Um, austerity worsened the situation. Um, there are bigger problems, as Mariana Mazzucato mentioned in the report, aging, environment, inequality. And these are huge challenges facing, really, the future. And unfortunately, unlike maybe in previous big tr transitions of capitalism in the 20th century, we don't really have a vision of how to resolve them. It's so not coordinated and... It's not particularly articulate. So was Theresa May right to go out today and defend uh, capitalism, the free market? Did that sound to you like confidence or fear? It sounded to me like a prime minister is realising that the other side has been talking about socialism. Tories have thought, oh, this is ridiculous, 1970s, nobody cares about that. But actually, there is quite a market for Jeremy Corbyn's ideas. Take the renationalisation. Two thirds of Tories want the rails services renationalised. They want utilities um, to be renationalised. So the Conservatives are thinking, well, maybe we should be engaging in these basic arguments in the same way that Labour has. Tories have got a habit for thinking the arguments were settled in the 80s, but they haven't. They need to be made right now, but Tories haven't made them for a very long time. If I can just go to you, Professor Wolf, uh, joining us from New York. Uh, as Anastasia was saying, this is global, isn't it? This is probably not a new thing. <laughs> it's not new, but speaking here from the United States, I can assure you that it is deeper than anything we have seen in my lifetime with my grey hair. It's rather long. Uh, I've never seen Americans on a scale, left, right, old, young, questioning the system, showing that they are not willing to go along with an old, stale debate about public versus private. They're beyond that. They want fundamental changes. And the vision that's emerging here as people question and challenge capitalism is the notion that the way we go forward has to be at the base of society. Right. That if we want it to work differently, it's that worker co-op idea, that changing the way the enterprise works is where we have to focus. And just to bring this back to the studio, there's a difference, isn't there, between questioning how capitalism works and saying it's time to overthrow it. Uh, neither of you would be an advocate for something so radical that you don't have capitalism at its basis, would you say? No, it's the only game in town. Um, but You still believe that? Yeah. Yes. But there are varieties of capitalism and there are varieties of relationships 
that govern it. And, and Fraser, as a free marketeer, you know, as, as a spectator editor, would you stand here now, sit here now and say, actually, the Tories do have to have bigger ideas, they do have to do things differently, they do have to incorporate socialist elements into their policy. <laughs> Not socialist elements because they tend to make everybody poorer. What the Tories need to do is make the argument for basic wealth creation. They can't assume that these arguments were won. Uh, and I mean it's funny to think that right now you've got employment at a record high, inequality at a 30-year low. Um, it's So many things are going right in the economy and the Conservatives think they speak for themselves but they don't. You need to articulate it. You need to say for example that since when David Cameron came in in 2010, since then is those at the bottom whose incomes have gone up the most and those at the top whose incomes have gone down. So they the were most. asking the wrong question, possibly. I mean, after the financial crash, we were all told it had to be about austerity. That was a chance to reset the whole economic structure, wasn't it? And say, this isn't about austerity necessarily, this is about equality, first and foremost. Yeah, it's about social progress. But the so was that wrong, do you think? Yes, they, they, they chose the wrong one. Yes, they chose a whole bunch of issues. They've been talking really about fairness, about social cohesion, because this was a progressive Conservative government that brought society closer together. They never made that point, and now nobody believes it. And Anastasia, when you hear a Conservative voice, um, who is sort of meeting you that far, what does that tell you about Jeremy Corbyn about his position, John McDonnell, who you worked alongside. What do they have to do now if they're going to secure this? Well, to be honest, uh, I would agree with, with Fraser that um, there is a, an emerging centre ground for a need for resolution or a, or a different diagnosis. I would say that one of the big mistakes in addition to austerity, that was a, a, quite a fatal um, political decision, um, was this unspoken understanding that we should really return to pre-crisis 2007 type of level of the economy, um, where this was the point precisely where things, why they broke down. Mm. So to restore at that particular level the financial system, the economy, the orient for growth, the balance between public and private or market and state. Um, that possibly was the visionary um, mistake. Uh, Professor Wolf, there's this sort of tagline, this meme that's taken on here, I don't know whether it's over there, called centrist dads, the idea of somebody who just can't get their head around a more progressive type of politics. Do you think when you talk about Marxism, you're talking about a throwback to the 70s or you're talking about something brand new? I'm talking about something brand new, you know, Marxism has evolved and the critique of capitalism and the critique of socialism as it was practiced over the last century, all of those things have been superseded. They've been criticized. People have learned. That's why the focus is now not on the state doing more or less. I would disagree respectfully with the others. We've tried virtually every type of capitalism I can imagine. State involved, state not so much involved, a little more of this, a little more of that. We're done with that, at least here in the United States. The thrust well, let, of let where people want to go is something else. And you know, changing the organization of the enterprise, democratizing it, is a fundamental shift that's not containable within the capitalist shell, and that's where people are going, at least here. Let me ask you what sounds like a very obvious question, but you might throw some light on it. What is Donald Trump? Is, is your president a, a capitalist or a protectionist, or is he trying to throw the system upside down? How do you view him, in economic terms at least? In economic terms, he is a sign that the old establishment debate, Republican, Democrat, Keynesian, liberal, all of that, it's beside the point. Nobody wants it anymore. He was the one able to come forward on the right, which is where America is, and say, I'm something new and different and throw all of that and, out. And, and, and Mr. Sanders on the other side, that's the sign that we're going in an altogether new direction. Right. His is the old packaged as though it were something new. For most Americans, they already see that, watching in dismay as he does his, his okay. games and his tweets. Yeah. But they want to go somewhere else. So, so, Fraser, as a conservative, you have to have something to conserve. As a capitalist, presumably, you have to have capital. Mm. So, 
if young people today don't see that they have anything to conserve mortgages or houses or capital, mm. where do those new conservatives come from then? Well, that's certainly a problem. The asset bubble, made worse, of course, by the government and QE, means the house prices are so high now that a new generation of young voters doesn't think it's going to have a stake in the free market system. It doesn't think it can lose anything by having Jeremy Corbyn and John McDonald, avowed Marxists, roll the dice. So you've lost them? Well, the, the Conservatives need to do a lot more to win them back and to demonstrate the appeal and how the free market system is everybody's best way to a more prosperous future. I mean, globally, global poverty is, you know, 10% now. It was 40% when mm. I was born. It's collapsing. And even in Britain, the, the wealth creation of the last generation is incredible. Nothing does it better, but you need to articulate the success. And you think, Anastasia, that this is the right track as opposed to just a protest track? Not necessarily, because this debate, and it's interesting to hear an American perspective, this debate is very uh, oriented towards a very national solution. Mm. Uh, that's what we can see on both sides of the parties. Uh, but all the big challenges, including inequality and structural problems, will be defined by the big rule makers of the 21st century, continental powers, EU, China, US. And if you're not working in coordination, you're alone and your that capacity to resolve the whole them. big question, Absolutely. which is where we've just arrived at. Thank you all very much indeed.